and yet it somehow got even worse. There's a difficult question to answer when it comes to covering Velma. Am I sitting here now with six episodes of this peculiar travesty to watch back to back the abuser, or am I the abused? Is Velma doing more damage to me than I am doing to it? I've had plenty of people implore me not to finish off the series. These lovely well-wishers are very concerned about my mental health, and I appreciate that. But by the same token, I've had many more people demand that I do finish off the series. These people do not care about my mental health, and I appreciate that as well. I am apparently both a sadist and a masochist, so pick up your lube and your barbed wire dildo and let's see who's sitting comfortably once all this is over. As best I can recall, we left the show with Fred having been exonerated after another schoolgirl was murdered while he was in prison. The plot, such as it is, is nominally about uncovering the mysterious serial killer who goes around offing all the girls the show keeps telling us are hot, while carefully skirting around the fact that they're all about 15 years old. Velma gives him feminist literature in a bit to change him, which of course drives him completely mad, only then to reject him when he turns up having been duly changed in the desirable ways by the feminist literature. Velma, of course, has the hots for both Fred and Daphne, and because Velma is fundamentally a self-insert character, they also have the hots for her. The only unrequited hots are between Velma and Not Shaggy, because Not Shaggy is not shaggable enough to be worth her time. That bit of wordplay is funnier than anything in the show, and it's it's not even that funny. That Velma is far and away the least attractive person on the planet is, of course, mentioned. Half the show's alleged jokes have to do with Velma's profound fugliness, but because the show has about the same regard for the rules of narrative comedy as Bill Clinton had for- Ahem, <clears throat> as I was saying, it doesn't actually impact her relationships in any way. She is afforded the chance to pick and choose her love interests despite her being, well, this. The frankly horrific dancing naked pregnant lady scene from episode 1 has its, um, payoff, with the birth of Velma's stepsister, which may or may not be relevant to proceedings. Daphne, meanwhile, is on the hunt for her biological parents because she isn't satisfied being reared by her adoptive lesbo-cop mums, and not Shaggy has bumped into some random cool Gigi and instantly fallen in love with her. Now you might be thinking, there doesn't seem to be an awful lot of actual plot contained within that brief summary. And you would be absolutely right to think that, because there's really not an awful lot of actual plot to talk about. It's mostly padding. Pop culture jokes that don't actually reference pop culture, repeated gags about Fred's dick and how it's too small to gag on in the first place, that's another joke you won't find in the show, episodic bouts of aggression toward white people, occasional lessons in feminism, bouts of furtive lesbianism that, to be honest, are far and away the show's most endearing aspects. In fact, the only thing Velma has less of than plot is comedy. But anyway, we have many episodes to cover, and not much time in which to do it. We are very shortly to get cracking. But before we get on with that, a word from my sponsor. A VPN is like a condom. Better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. And so, as someone who never goes anywhere unprotected, allow me to recommend Surfshark's VPN. It's an app and a browser extension. One subscription applies to an unlimited number of devices. And it doesn't just keep your data private. It lets you realize the full potential of the internet. Want to watch a show on Netflix but it's not available in your region? Well, get what you've paid for. Just click the button, change your location, and it's yours. Are you an American who wants to watch real sport, like actual football? Or are you a European who wants to watch the ad breaks between what Americans call football? Well, that's yours as well. Surfshark is the solution. You can get 83% off a Surfshark VPN plus an extra three months free subscription at the link in my description using my code PLATOON. That's surfshark.deals slash P-L-A-T-O-O-N PLATOON. The world is a scary place and it is only getting scarier. You don't want your data used in some AI-generated ad for a product you'd be embarrassed to use. You don't want to be the face used as the disappointing husband in an advert for Chinese Viagra, for example. Well, freedom isn't free, but it is worth it. Surfshark's VPN lets you conduct your business with the privacy you deserve. So give it a go, Surfshark VPN, and no one need ever know that you've been secretly watching Velma and enjoying it. Alright then, on we go. As if to emphasize the points I've just made, Episode 5's plot recap, which you'd think would have picked the best and funniest moments from Episode 4, closes with this little skit. I feel like all the answers to my questions about my parents are in there. The bathrooms? Wait, I mean in there. Which wasn't funny then, isn't funny now, and is probably still one of the better jokes in the show so far. We're reminded at the beginning that Velma has hallucinations and wants to, um, run at Daphne 
with a pair of scissors, but at least this constitutes the show remembering something about itself, because it very quickly proceeds to forget everything again. Velma's dad is going away for the night, and Velma complains that he's leaving her all alone while there's a murderer on the loose. She informs us that she was voted most likely to be murdered before all this, which, if I suddenly lost all self-respect and became cinema sins, would constitute two sins. In the first place, we've already done the I was voted most likely to joke. We did it quite recently, in fact. People only think you murdered Brenda because you- We're voted most revengey in the school yearbook, I know. In the second place, Velma already knows, but has apparently forgotten, what the murderer's MO is. We know what the murderer's MO is because the entirety of the last episode was about that. In that episode, it was determined that the murderer was only targeting attractive, not to mention underaged, girls. Velma was tasked with writing a list of the hottest girls in the school in order that pervy police chief might give them a security detail. The show actually made a point to tell us that Velma was in no danger because she isn't hot. That's a very insensitive thing to say. I mean, especially from a student who is in no danger from a hot girl murderer. If you are going to junk the established mechanics of your show in order to cram a joke in, it'd better be a very good joke. Even though I was voted most likely to be murdered before any of this? That is not a very good joke. That isn't even a good joke. I'm not actually sure it rises to the level of joke. Despite everyone being very aware that there's a serial killer on the loose, the school has not thought it prudent to cancel the marching band sleepover that doubtless serves as this episode's contrived premise. We then, um, sit down for this one, we then get something that actually resembles a joke. Good morning, students. This is Principal Rogers. I'm here with Mayor Dave and the Sheriff. Everybody, listen up. We just learned someone somewhere is being intolerant. <laughs> That, that that kind of works. I mean, it's it's lazy as hell. It's really just a throwaway little skit, but it does actually resemble something we might call comedy, meaning episode 5 is off to a terrific start by the standards of this show. A joke that almost works. I bet it can't keep this up. It then decides it does remember the hotness mechanic from the previous episode, but only in order to dispense with it. The sheriff informs the school that the police detail has resigned because they keep getting sexually harassed by the probably underage girls, meaning a curfew has been instituted instead, resulting in the cancellation of that marching band sleepover I thought would be the contrived premise for this episode. I still think that will be the contrived premise for this episode, not least because the episode is actually titled Marching Band Sleepover. Though given the show is dispatched with pretty much every other rule of writing, I suppose it's quite possible naming conventions have been murdered as well. It's now Daphne's turn to forget what happened five minutes ago. You might recall, but if you've got any sense, you won't, that she abandoned the search for her parents at the Crystal Caves in the last episode because Not Shaggy refused to go in with her, and her shtick at that precise moment was Dumb Popular Girl. She abandoned the search because she was afraid whoever might be inside the caves would think her unpopular if she went in alone. Now, though, she's going back to the caves alone to resume the search. The show has occasionally decided to do not terrible things with Daphne in the past. I said in the last video that the on-off lesbian relationship with Velma being the only non-cruel bit of characterization in the show was almost tolerable. But as I also pointed out in that video, the show's approach to characterization is that everyone has multiple disconnected dimensions, but only ever one dimension at a time, meaning the show positively discourages any kind of investment in it because that investment will never go anywhere. And here we are again. Daphne's been the superficial popular dumb bitch, then the independent but surprisingly heartfelt vulnerable girl, then the dumb superficial popular bitch, and now she's back to being the independent-minded intrepid explorer girl type thing. Yeah. That's what the narrative demands. It's just that the narrative demands that the characterization be about as confused as Ezra Miller on a bender, meaning this Daphne is simply not the same person as the Daphne who came to the caves in the last episode because, um, uh, because comedy, really? That's, that's about the extent of the explanation I can come up with. There's a warning notice over the entrance to the caves, which occasions this attempt at humor. Sorry, sign, but hot people are cut too much slack to heed warnings. Attacking quote-unquote hot people is one of this show's favorite pastimes. It's one of its very small number of bits. Meta pop culture, tiny dicked white guy, hallucinations, hot people suck. The problem, when you have such a small repertoire and so many episodes to fill, is that you tend to have to shoehorn in these, um, jokes 
far too often and in all the wrong places. It's barefacedly cheap, forced, contrived, a bit like making three videos about a show everyone knows is absolute dog shit when you could be outside doing something else. Oh fuck, that's a meta joke. I've been infected by Velma. Somebody call the clinic. Daphne gets yanked inside by some unseen foe and we're back to the school, where Fred is still trying to impress Velma with feminism. Because he's inexplicably in love with Velma now, he is trying to help her out by being a male feminist, which, to give it its due, the show does a serviceable job putting down. Look, I'm glad reading the feminine mystique caused a little growth. Shush, a feminist is speaking. Dr. Edna Perdue was a female neurologist. You don't need to say female, Velma. You can just say neurologist. Ah! Apparently one of the few things feminists and not feminists can agree on is that male feminists are some of the most insufferably embarrassing people on the planet and ought really to be sent to the gulag. But he also tries to help by pushing the plot along. It turns out his house was once owned by a mad scientist, which is relevant for reasons we'll come on to, and this means we have to go find Not Shaggy, which I guess is also relevant for reasons we might come on to, though in this case we might not, who knows. Gigi and Not Shaggy don't want to help, however. Daphne, meanwhile, meets a couple of people disguised as what I, I think these are the Slag brothers, aren't they, who claim to be her parents. They claim that they never abandoned her, as was her origin story, rather she was taken from them by the Lesbo cops, and then they disappear. How very mysterious. Fred and Velma go to an historical society looking for records left by the mad scientist, only to discover that Velma's mum has taken them for reasons unknown, which inevitably, but at least consistently, triggers another hallucination in Velma. The established mechanic by which she's broken out of these is that somebody makes her laugh, but when she asks Fred to make her laugh, he refuses on the grounds that he's too obsessed thinking about the gender fucking pay gap. I, I would, but all I can think of right now is the gender pay gap. Is it funny? Women make 20% less than men, and women of color even less? <laughs> I can't stop laughing. Which I guess means we can sympathize with Velma in that not only has Fred failed to make her laugh, he's failed to make us laugh as well. I genuinely don't know what the show was even trying to achieve with this one. It's quite often impossible to tell when it's trying to be genuine and when it's being knowingly disingenuous. I know it does try to be genuine from time to time, such as Velma's astoundingly hypocritical spiel in the last episode about patriarchy, body shaming, women and all the rest of it. Astoundingly hypocritical, given it's voiced by a character who does nothing except body shaming Fred and his tiny penis. Which leads me to believe that it is trying to be genuine here as well. You don't typically go from preaching feminist dogma to ridiculing it and then back again unless you are yourself a bit fucking mental. But this little bit doesn't even really qualify as the kind of applause comedy that constitutes the bulk of quote-unquote progressive and especially feminist humour. You know, the impassioned rant sprinkled with the odd pseudo-edgy joke that the audience is really supposed to nod along and clap to, not laugh with? There absolutely are ways to make invoking the gender pay gap funny. In fact, it quite often is funny just by being invoked, because it bears absolutely no resemblance to reality, and is only trotted out by people who have no fundamental attachment to reality. The gender pay gap doesn't exist. It's been invented by a bunch of metropolitan professional women who take too much time off and think other people are to blame for it. But again, the show typically espouses this mindset. It doesn't usually make it the target of a joke, so... So here, when it's placed in lieu of a joke, taking up the space where a joke should be, well, it just renders the whole thing clunky and awkward and, and generally awful, and I have no idea what it's trying to do. As if to prove that point, Velma does earnest feminism in the very next scene. Still, if I can separate reality dating show's exploitation of women from my obsessive need to watch them, I can separate Gigi from Norville. The context, by the way, is that she's decided she needs to break Not Shaggy away from Gigi so he can help her again. Say, remember how I predicted the episode would still find a way to contrive that marching band sleepover into being its premise? Well, to nobody's surprise whatsoever, I was right. Velma somehow reasons that hosting the marching band sleepover at her house and having not Shaggy come along will aid her in her quest to ruin his relationship. Say, remember how this show is supposed to be about tracking down, finding and unmasking a serial killer? No? Well, I mean, I don't really blame you. It is truly impressive how Velma manages to do anything except follow its A-plot. Deviations are perfectly acceptable in theory, though I think the sheer number of them in this show would probably make even a brilliant writer seem intolerable. But they do actually need to serve a purpose, have a reason to be, accomplish something in aid of the story as a whole or the characters within it. Velma's many distractions do none of that. 
I think we've spent 15 times longer piddling about with appalling relationship drama than we've actually spent engaging with the mainline story. Speaking of mind-numbingly tedious distractions, Daphne gives us a history of the Crystal Cave mind attraction and the gang of ex-employees who live there from whom she is apparently descended. I, I don't give a damn. I, I really don't. She goes to tell Velma, who doesn't give a damn about it either, because, as you might recall, they're madly in love, as the show took care to remind us literally 13 minutes ago at the beginning of the episode. But never the fuck mind, I guess. We can't remember that yet because that would be inconvenient to the comedy. Gigi and Velma have a flute off, yes, to see who gets to win not Shaggy. <laughs> Daphne confronts the Lesbo cops about why they stole her origin story from Superman. I guess that, I mean, well, it's a reference that actually references something, so that's actually an improvement. Via an exchange I'm not going to waste anybody's time by recounting, Velma learns that the mad scientist she's been looking for is actually not Shaggy's grandmother. To prolong the torment, we then get another side quest, as Velma manipulates not Shaggy into stealing a cop car to go to a restaurant to pick up food for the band nerds who are hungry so hungry that they are currently eating her house. Because comedy. The cop car opens a sewer grate which interests Daphne, who, in an apt metaphor for this show as a whole, is about to dive into a river full of liquid shit. Velma herself has a moment of character development in realizing that she's a horrible person and not Shaggy is a better friend than she is. So she decides to sacrifice herself to distract the cops so her friends can escape with the food, even though the whole point of them stealing a cop car earlier to begin with was that it would allow them to escape the attention of the cops, but who cares? The last time that Velma had character development was, I think, her realizing her feelings for Daphne, which has been temporarily forgotten about in this episode because she's now not giving a flying shit about Daphne and her feelings because she's too focused on herself. The time before that was when she realized that her mother had left because she'd been horrible to her and not because of some mystery kidnapping, which of course was completely retconned by the end of that same episode, as Velma decided that actually it was a mystery kidnapping after all, and her being a c had nothing to do with her mother's disappearance. Following which pattern, this moment of realization, that she's a horrible person and her friends are better friends than she is, will I'm sure be operative for… what, 10 minutes? Before that too is retconned and her character resets with no acknowledgement that the arc has been aborted. Apparently you can get paid lots of money by HBO to write this shit, it turns out Not Shaggy's mum was also picked up for breaking curfew, and upon leaving prison the morning after, she promises Velma that she'll tell her everything she needs to know about her mother, the mad scientist woman. She had absolutely no involvement in the plot until this moment, she's never been aware of Velma's interest in her mother, she has no incentive to tell Velma all these things she didn't know she wanted to know, which makes the entirety of the proceeding completely fucking pointless. All that wasted time, all that wasted money on a mystery-solving episode that had its mystery solved at the end by a character who wasn't at all involved in the attempt to solve it because comedy. The entire plot hinged on Velma taking a selfie of the school principal. The entire plot consisted of three scenes amounting to perhaps 20 seconds. Velma discovers mad scientist, Velma takes selfie of principal, Principal promises to reveal information to stop Velma posting selfie online. Everything else in this episode, all 24, 25 minutes of it, was side quest and filler. Perhaps one day in the far distant future, Velma will be remembered for heralding the dawn of an entirely new literary style, anti-writing, the point of which is to string the audience along with a seemingly interminable collection of bad jokes, bad humor, bad characters, bad plot, only to then render the whole thing a soul-crushing waste of time, if it wasn't already, by having the payoff make everything redundant. Daphne goes back to the caves. There she meets the Slag brothers again, one of whom is the prisoner I think Fred was bunking with in jail in an earlier episode. They claim that they are her parents, that they might be, they might not be, I don't care. And on we go to episode six. Episode six is nominally about how shit parents are. You can tell that because the title tells you that's what it's nominally about. But given this is Velma, we can be pretty sure that it's going to feature for about 3 minutes of the 24 minute runtime, and the rest will be… Yeah, exactly what you'd expect of Velma. Velma goes to speak to the principal about her mad scientist mother, while not Shaggy accompanies her to ensure she doesn't hallucinate. The school principal explains that her mad scientist mother had found a way to keep the human brain alive outside the body. This could, for all I know, be the true story behind the making of this show, which has apparently been written by the body from which the brain was extracted after said extraction. That is a meta comment. The in-universe observation is, of course, that all the murdered girls have had their brains removed. 
We remember this because the show made a joke about it once. Ah! She has no brain! Oh, I am not dissing her. She has no brain! Ah! Ah, comedy. Now then, the show does actually achieve something with this little bit of backstory. What it achieves is the most convoluted, longest build-up to a shit pun ever devised for the screen. Ready for it? Here we go. Back in the 1960s, some evil army man was pissed off by some hippies. Fair enough, I sympathize. Meddling kids, as the show repeatedly calls them. He tried infiltrating them via various silly means, but he always failed. But then, he heard about mad scientists' brain experiments, and he thought to himself, would it be possible to place the brains of soldiers inside these hippies? I mean, these meddling kids. He approached mad scientist with a plan. That plan was called the Special Covert Operations Brain Initiative, which reads as Scooby. Yes, yeah, yeah, but hold on a minute, that's not actually the punchline. I hope you've got an empty bladder for this one, because because really, you, you're going to piss yourselves laughing. It's really that good. Having heard this explanation, Velma asks the school principal, Scooby? And wait, what did Scooby do? They said fucking Scooby do, guys, they did a pun. It only took them four minutes and 24 seconds. Honestly, I think we could just end this video here. I don't think we can beat that. I, I feel like we've we've kind of completed the show now. There's nothing to be gained by continuing. Yep, well, that's a wrap then. See you next time. Except, of course, it's not. And we haven't even reached the bit where Velma twerks over a corpse yet. So, no, actually, we've got a long way to go. The Scooby plan failed, and Mad Scientist went mad and was placed in the insane asylum. The show then does what is quite possibly the most random disconnected white people joke of all the random disconnected white people jokes it's done so far. I mean, playing God, removing brains, that's some white people shit. She was always a trailblazer. There, there, are, there are no words. Let's just park that one and move on. Velma makes the connection I made ages ago and links the various torn threads of this plot into something vaguely resembling a plot. The disappearances and the murders are all linked, you see. But because that would seem to have given us a very obvious place to very efficiently go next in order to keep the story moving, that particular orgasm has to be ruined by a cutaway to Daphne in the Crystal Caves, where it turns out the gang she thinks are her parents have some super secret ulterior motive for inviting her into their inner sanctum that she is not allowed to know yet. And because that would seem to have given us a very obvious place to very efficiently go next in order to keep this story moving, that particular orgasm has to be ruined by a cutaway to Velma, who's been revived from a hallucination-induced by an almost revelation in the previous scene. Now, I've praised the hallucinations before, and by praised I mean I've pointed out that the show has deployed them consistently, which bare minimum standard has otherwise been entirely beyond its writers. Unfortunately though, the show has just as consistently proven itself able to ruin good things, and so this serviceable mechanic has somehow been leveraged against the plot of the show because the school principal is now refusing to tell Velma anything more about the mystery until she's overcome her hallucinations. I believe this is what Captain Tonal Loke would call an artificial barrier of blockage. The show has used its one consistent mechanic to actually halt plot progression, thereby ensuring that we have to waste, one would assume, at least the rest of this episode on nonsensical garbage. Because comedy. Velma decides that the only way around this is to get to the bottom of her hallucinations. You know, just like she did way back in episode 1 before she retconned that. You might point out that she already knows at least two ways to overcome her hallucinations, not Shaggy making her laugh, which won't work anymore because he's in love with Gigi, not her, and Daphne kissing her. The quickest, easiest, and simplest solution in her mind should be, I need to find Daphne which would dovetail with the recent reminder at the beginning of the episode that she's still in love with her, and here comes the scissoring joke again. Scissor me timbers! But because that would make sense, and feasibly allow the story to move along a bit and actually be in keeping with an established character relationship and goal set, no. No, we have to go back in time to the origin of her hallucinations again, just like we did in episode 1 with a flashback. Not Shaggy theorizes that it wasn't actually her mother's mysterious disappearance that caused the hallucinations because she'd actually been searching for her mother before the hallucinations ever started. A fairly important piece of information you'd think might have been trailed in the show before now, but this is Velma, so no. Not Shaggy is a man, though, so of course he can't be allowed to actually theorize a solution to this quandary. He simply raises this point of information in order that Velma be able to do what Velma always does and solve everything herself. 
By the way, you might recall that a substantial part of an earlier episode involved Not Shaggy learning to become a therapist with the aid of his therapist dad's magic cardigan. Were this show actually interested in, um, itself, or its plot, or its characters, this might have been a moment to revisit that. Have Not Shaggy used that cardigan and all those skills again to bring out something from Velma's subconscious that she's too embarrassed to admit to herself. You could even keep the daddy issues joke if you really wanted to, but you'd then have baked it into the show in a way that actually makes use of a previous episode's otherwise entirely redundant subplot. So she hypothesizes that, in fact, the real cause of her hallucinations is that she has always wanted her dad to love her, and that the hallucinations are her subconscious prohibiting her search for her mother, because reminding her dad that her mother left them would make it harder for him to love her. Which is a very long and convoluted way of saying, <gasps> Wait, oh no, I hallucinate because I have daddy issues. Gross! So she goes to chat with her dad. Meanwhile, in the Crystal Caves, we learn that the Crystal Cave gang are mining crystals because their plan is to sell them to idiot spiritualists and millennials who believe in crystal healing in order to fund their escape to Angola. I didn't make that up, I might as well have done. Velma attempts to make her dad love her over a lunch at a strip club, but once again, we can't have a quick resolution, this trauma has to be prolonged. So that conversation goes nowhere at first, and we're instead treated to a long segment where Fred's dad takes him to the strip club in a bid to make him stop being in love with Velma, which culminates in Velma, 15 years old, remember, doing a pole dance in a bid to get her dad's attention. Because this episode's meta is daddy issues, and there are literally no depths the show will not plunder in order to get this across. God, well, I, I suppose if there's one thing to be said in the show's favor, it's that it only dwelt on a 15-year-old pole dancing for her dad for like a few minutes. That's, that's the level we're on. Honestly, I could be reviewing MILF Manor and it'd probably be marginally more edifying than this. Thankfully, we get to move on from that with a montage of parent-sibling relations. Velma's dad tries to learn how to be a good father, Fred's dad continues trying to make Fred be a man, Shaggy learns not to be a beta male by observing his pathetic father and resolving to do the opposite. By the way, that label, beta male, was pinned on him by Velma, who, you might remember, had a moment of character progression in the previous episode where she realized she was a cunt and needed to be a better friend. Remember how I predicted that would be retcon just like every other moment of character development in the show? I'm not saying that because I expect applause for it, by the way, but because I'm stuck with certain conventions? Ordinarily, prediction takes at least a little bit of analysis and cognitive application. It, it doesn't with Velma, Velma's just awful, and it's awful so often and in so many of the same ways that you can see its awfulness coming several episodes in advance. But at least if I act as if I'm critiquing a serious piece of media, there's a chance I can delude myself into thinking this is a fruitful use of my limited time on this planet. The montage actually isn't that terrible an occurrence, by the way. It semi-competently makes the they fuck you up your mum and dad point that this episode sometimes remembers is its reason for being. The fact we only got here because of a 15-year-old girl pole dancing for her own father is best pushed out of your mind as far as possible as quickly as possible. Let's just pretend that didn't happen. Happily, or not, it actually wasn't required for any of the subsequent events to make sense. It was just redundant debauchery. It's the best kind of debauchery, honest. It turns out Velma's dad wasn't really that interested in her, though. He was just feigning interest as a ruse to get him out of paternity leave and back to work. This irritates Velma, but it does also convince her that she doesn't want her dad's love after all, meaning that she won't hallucinate anymore, thus allowing the plot to move forward again. She believes she's overcome that artificial barrier of blockage behind which this entire pointless episode was piling up, and she's right. So here we go with another exposition dump which is what always happens. All plot progression in this show is squeezed into little 30-second windows, usually around the close of the second third of each episode. The rest is entirely pointless. By the end of this, there's probably a very quick and easy supercut to be made splicing these segments together, the entire A-plot of Velma exposited inside five minutes. The funniest thing about this entire show would be if that supercut proved to be actually quite compelling. Mad Scientist Woman's secret lab is underneath Fred's house, which Velma's mum found out about, leading Velma off to the secret lab in a bid to learn more. Back in the caves, that ulterior motive possessed by Daphne's supposed parents that nobody really gave a damn about anyway, turns out to be that they want to use her as a hostage in the event her adoptive lesbocop mums show up to stop them. Adoptive lesbocop mums show up and stop them, so, so that worked well. Velma turns up at Fred's, and he agrees to help her in a bid to stand up to his father. 
but the basement is still bricked up, suggesting, at least seemingly, that Velma's mother never went in there to begin with, but Fred still tries to open the brick door and it collapses on them. Meanwhile, Daphne realizes that her real parents really were dickheads who abandoned her twice. Her lesbocop mums are all right, actually. This, this one, might, in fact, be relevant later, so alone of all the pieces of information we've had so far, it's probably worth keeping it to one side. Back at Fred's house, Velma's dad improbably appears in the basement and rescues Velma from underneath the rubble. They go down into the basement. She finds a piece of paper with jinkies written on it in her mother's handwriting, meaning her mom was there after all. She hallucinates, but her dad says he believes her now about the mother's disappearance, so the hallucination goes away. In the mid credit scene, Daphne's escaping birth mother gets accosted and presumably murdered by the serial killer in a mask. That's the end. Joking aside, that episode had an overarching message that was neither cheap nor disgusting, which is a surprise, because this is an episode of Velma. Adopting the standard used by defenders of, for example, Avatar The Way of Water, it had a good theme, which makes it not woke and therefore good. I did a big old video on that, by the way. You should go watch it after this one. It's, it's actually serious media criticism, as opposed to whatever the fuck this is. Flogging the mentally ill, maybe? Had I watched this episode before doing that review, though, it would have been a brilliant example of why themes alone do not make for good movies and television. Because I can't help but recall that in service of what is genuinely quite a nice theme of family, we just had a huge amount of tedious contrived nonsense culminating in a 15-year-old pole dancing to get her dad's attention. Yeah, I, I know I know. we said we'd move on from that as quickly as possible. I did just, I had to mention it one more time because because it really happened and it's, yeah, okay, maybe now's the time. We'll just, we're just going to move on now. The episode also remembered one of Daphne's through lines, fear of abandonment, with the realization that the birth parents she'd been hankering after had actually abandoned her after all, and her lesbo cop mums are actually much better for and to her. Unusually for this show, this characterization will actually be built on in an episode or two, in a way that isn't terrible and so deserves mentioning now because of how unusually good it is. Episode 7, then. That begins on an optimistic note. Velma informs us that now her hallucinations are over, she can dedicate herself entirely to solving the mystery of her mother's disappearance, from which you might assume that this is the meaty part of the show, the part where it puts away childish things and actually gets on with the goddamn plot for a change. You might well assume that. You, you would be wrong to assume it, but, you know, you might. Velma tells us how she went back through all her mum's old manuscripts looking for clues, which is the kind of thing you'd think she might have done before now. Hallucinations might have stopped her doing it directly, but are we really going to believe that she never asked Not Shaggy to read them for her? He's been her errand boy since episode 1, he's been shown doing exactly this kind of thing. Not that it makes any difference because the notes leave her no clues, nor do any of the other leads she pursues. All the while, we're shown her ignoring Daphne's attempts to get in touch with her, suggesting we're probably going back over the abandonment motif in short order. That's not necessarily a bad thing, these two are the only two characters with what might be described as an actual relationship, and I think you can already see how Daphne's realization at the close of the previous episode might pay forward to further character development later. But it does, once again, somewhat jar with Velma's earlier realization that she's a piece of shit and a bad friend, a lesson that, in the event, was forgotten in far less time than it took her to learn it. The episode proper begins when she returns home to find that her dad's girlfriend, the dancing pregnant lady who recently became a mother, has been murdered. She's lying there on the floor covered in blood. We know Velma doesn't give a shit about her, or indeed about anybody else, but this is her dad's girlfriend. They've just had a kid together. And his reaction? Oh no. Oh look, a mystery. I he doesn't actually give a shit. Which, again, absent characterization, isn't rescued by the revelation that it was all a hoax setting up this episode's contrived premise. Because he didn't know it was a hoax at the time, and still he didn't give a shit. The show's been trying to make out that there has been trouble and strife in this relationship since the new kid arrived. Lots of stress and such. But apparently that was only a thing because the plot of the last episode demanded it be so, and because the plot of this episode doesn't, it's no longer a thing. But it's a blatant missed opportunity, as with everything else in the show, admittedly, because you could have spun some kind of joke out of that. Say she gets up and reveals it was a hoax, but she's incredibly pissed off that he didn't seem to care that she was dead. I mean, that's just basic setup and payoff, a single simple little joke, a little bit of character work builds on something established in the previous episode. Is that too much to ask, show? Well, yeah, it is, and to be honest, we've, we've known this for weeks, but, you know, keeping up appearances. So, we recently had the band camp sleepover of the contrived scene-setting device. In this episode, it's something called Fog Fest, which I, mean, I could describe, but what's the point? 
It's a festival, it takes place in some fog. Velma for once asks a salient question. How can this still be going on, given the serial killer and the curfew and such? It's a salient question, which is what makes it a dangerous question, because she's essentially pointing out that the writers don't have a clue what they're doing. Her father, though, he explains that it's all fine, the crisis is over now, because the murders have officially been pegged on the ghost of mad science lady, so everything's back to normal. <sighs> because... because comedy. To add more nonsense to an already dumb premise, and to dispense entirely with whatever fanciful notions we might have taken from Velma saying she was going to get on with the plot, Waitress Wife explains that girls won't be allowed to enter Fogfest unless they have a date, someone who can keep them safe. I played a game in the last video. Guess the missing word. I made it easy that time though because I gave you options like lizard, idiot, or white person, and this is Velma so the answer was obviously going to be white person. Let's make it though a little bit more challenging. If I tell you that Velma complains about the date rule, what is the substance of her complaint? Is it A. White people B. Sexism or C. A meta pop culture reference? They're all equally plausible because they also happen to be the only plausible options in the show because it has all the comedic range of Eleanor Roosevelt's corpsified sphincter, but the answer in this case is B. Sexism. That's right. Much like in the self-defense episode, a very sensible and proven to be effective protective measure is instantly dismissed as an assault on the fairer sex because nothing says an assault on women's integrity like protecting women from assault. By the way, one of the surest tells that these episodes are all written by different people is the extent to which Velma's feminism manifests itself and which wave of feminism manifests itself. Episodes where it's merely there anecdotally tend to be written by one writer or team of writers, but episodes where it forms the bulk of her characterization in a particularly vindictive way, they, I'm pretty sure, are written by a different writer. The last time she was egregiously feministic, it gave us that staggeringly hypocritical body shaming rant. This episode is going to go on to do something very similar. None of the intervening episodes, though, did suggesting that these two episodes, the body shaming one and this one, which have a tone that I think we'll call she hulky they might have been written by the same person. Oh look, I was right! Fred intends to invite Velma to the Fogfest thing, which irritates his parents. It irritates his parents because their company is sponsoring Fogfest, and so he has to win Fogfest King in order to prove that he and they and his company are all the best, because the best is what the company sells. A very cheap joke that is still miles better than anything in this show is that it seems already to have lost the plot in all this fog it keeps banging on about, but that doesn't work, sadly, because the show lost its plot well before the fog was introduced. So Fred can't date Velma, because if he does, he'll lose the competition. Meanwhile, more fucking relationship nonsense. Gigi is upset that not Shaggy has been ignoring her. Oh no! But then he turns up and invites her to Fogfest. I don't think there was ever much appetite for a Scooby-Doo spin-off show that doesn't you know, feature Scooby-Doo and in which all the characters have been completely transformed into the worst imaginable versions of themselves, but if there were any appetite for that kind of thing, I'm morally certain it would have evaporated had you told the audience, and instead of a story, we're just going to have them all try and you know, fuck each other in various combinations for 10 episodes. The words Scooby-Doo relationship drama have not to my knowledge, ever been used in that order by any sentient English-speaking person, for the simple reason that nobody would ever think to put them together because it has no utility whatever. The concept is a non-starter, but then, but then, along comes HBO Max. There's also a strong lockdown vibe coming from the show having Velma repeatedly express her frustration that the town isn't willing to stay inside just to stop a serial killer because they're all selfish and they want to party. What I don't understand is how it can still be happening with the serial killer on the loose. What happened to curfew? It was working. I would sort of overlook this, but it's not just one throwaway line. It's a repeated line, and it's delivered as though the writer does have some sort of gripe they're trying to convey. It might be me reading too much into it. It might be I'm just so desperate for content of any description that I'm now creating a headcanon in which the show actually tries to convey a serious and consistent point. I mean, hell, I was desperate enough to do anything except focus on the show itself that I did go looking to see if the writer had mentioned anything about lockdowns before. I did it for like five minutes, this is all I turned up, but you know, you can make of that what you will. But yeah, fuck it, the longer I delay, the longer this will take. Velma tries to get Daphne to go with her, but Fred turns up and bribes her into going with him, leaving Velma all alone, which would be sad 
and which would invite sympathy were it not exactly what she fucking deserves because she is a horrible person. You know, like the show pointed out to us recently in having her commit to change it before it had forgotten that it pointed it out by having her commit to changing it. Via one nonsensical leap or another, Velma realizes if she holds the Jinkies note up to a light, it'll reveal a phone number which she calls and uses the background noise to work out that the serial killer is at Fogfest. Silly Velma, you could have figured that out ages ago if you'd been paying attention to the writing in the show you're in. So she dresses up as a man and tries to sneak her way into Fogfest. The police officer tells her there's something funny about the way she's dressed. This, specifically, is what he says. There's something funny about you. Not LOL funny, but more thoughtful and well-observed, like a female-driven comedy. Well, and props to the writer, I guess, for recognizing that nobody laughs out loud at quote-unquote female-driven comedies, but... I'm afraid I really, really can't let thoughtful and well-observed female-driven comedy slide. This show is its own disproof. We live in a world where female-driven comedy is represented chiefly by the likes of Amy Schumer, Kathy Griffin, and Hannah Gadsby. The most recent female-led comedy on TV that entered my crosshairs was She-Hulk. There actually are funny women in the world, but trying to find them in the domain of studio-backed female-driven comedies is like blinding yourself with acid and hunting for a shiny Venusaur in the smoking ruins of the world's biggest Walmart. It's still a more pleasurable experience than watching Velma, but it's, it's not easy. So she punches him in the balls, and this is fine. You absolutely can get away with that. I frequently kick policemen in the nads, and I've never been arrested for it either. Not Shaggy Schmooze's Gigi. Fred tries to bribe people into voting for him to be Fog King. Velma falls off a high structure and disappointingly doesn't die. And then, because she's Velma, all the hot girls start falling for her in her male disguise. Whoever could have predicted such a thing? They include Drunk Daphne. I'm not especially prudish, by the way, about depicting probable minors drinking, not least because I'm British, which means A, we don't call them minors, and B, it's tacitly accepted over here that you've been drinking since you were at least, like, 14 years old if you came from a good family, three if you came from Scotland. They go off and they have a dance. Velma does the worm. She realizes, while doing the worm, that when people think she's a guy, everyone praises her for her worst qualities. Wait a second. As a guy, everyone thinks my worst qualities as a girl are awesome. No time! Ah, we're impressed. Ah, uh, yeah. Double standards, you guys. It's, it's doing the double standards thing again. It's absolute horseshit, of course. Though there actually is a double standard at play. That double standard is when trendy feminist writers deploy tricks like this to belittle an entire sex in a way they would absolutely despise were it to happen the other way around. You might almost call it toxic femininity. <clears throat> Sorry, I I'm back from the re-education camp now. Hooray for Velma! Calling out double standards in a fair and accurate and empowering way. Guys suck. Yay vagina. Because men get praised for their worst qualities, apparently. Velma stands up and uses her masculine authority to tell people that ghosts aren't real. And the serial killer is still on the loose. Which, I mean, well, she's right, isn't she? But the show wants us to think that the only reason people are listening to her now is because she's a man. People never listen to women in the same way, apparently, which is why nobody has ever heard of or been expected to respect Hillary Clinton, Jacinda Ardern, or Nicola Sturgeon because of the fact they have vaginas and that overrides the fact that they are objectively shit politicians. And then it does that thing again. Hey, Look, I know that as Americans we want to party, but curfew cannot end because the serial killer is still on the loose. <gasps> no, I, I'm, I'm just going to call this now. This is a lockdown allegory. The writer is from the Taylor Loren school of wimpy global annihilation. My vulnerability is my identity. The world must stop until I feel safe. To be honest, the general tone and tenor and general moral decrepitness of this show means it would be very unsurprising if this was the messaging behind this episode. It's touched every other asinine belief of the fashionable idiot class. Why not this one as well? Man Velma is voted Fog King, leading to more of this. Holy crap! No wonder men are so desperate to hold onto their power. This is the easiest shit ever. As a guy, I can do anything. Highest suicide rate, lowest educational attainment rate, highest homelessness rate, highest overdose rate, highest incarceration rate, lowest success rate in custody battles, can be drafted, only class against whom discrimination is both acceptable and apparently championed. Look, I'm not an MRA, I think the men's rights movement is all kinds of cringe, but if you wonder why movements like that take off, you could do worse than begin by looking at the treatment of men in pop culture as written by affluent middle-class professional women. 
Hell, the woman who wrote this episode is complaining that talentless men get elevated way above their station and ability on the back of their worst qualities. The part hasn't so much as met the kettle, as it's met it, drugged it, kidnapped it, killed it, and dumped it in a ditch beside the nearest interstate. And just in case we miss this wanton parade of entitled ignorance, we get a little montage of Man Velma beating out poor women in competitions for jobs and prizes. Drunk Daphne and Man Velma meet up, and Drunk Daphne finally gets a chance to explain the story of her parents to someone. Man Velma again seems to acknowledge that she's been a shit friend, but we've seen that before, so we already know how that's going to pan out. And then Fred busts her disguise, and everyone hates her, and not Shaggy wins Fog King instead. Actual Velma bumps into Daphne again and explains she kept up the disguise because, and I quote, But as a guy, there's so little consequence for your actions. I was like, I'd be an idiot not to at least try and go for it. Baba Booey! When you are a man, there are no consequences for your actions. Do you ever feel like having that much power on your show has led to being a little unprofessional? I think the temptation is there. The temptation. And I have, I have succumbed to that temptation. <laughs> um, we, we've had a lot of handsome actors on the show. Uh, but we had this uh, one actor on the show named Lee Pace. Picture, there he is, that's a good looking guy. That's a very good looking guy, yeah. Came on the show and we had to do this flashback sequence where we were in bed together in college. That in the middle of it, he was, he was just supposed to be like, what do you think, Mindy? And I was like. <laughs> it's not that, see, you just went for it. You just, just started I, kissing that guy, that, was, that picture, he, yeah. And then I walk backstage, we have two writer producers, um, Ike and Ike Baron Heltz and David Sasson, and they were like, hey man, what are you doing? You could be sued for that. And I got very scared, uh, and then I said, um, tell anyone and you're fired. <laughs> so I will simply say that this show is objectively one of the worst fictional creations ever, and its predominantly female writing team has been given a second season. So, um, yeah, yeah, funny, that, that consequences thing, isn't it? They don't seem to apply to you guys either. Velma and Daphne have a heart-to-heart, -heart, then get accosted by a presumed serial killer. There follows an actual Scooby-Doo reference, which would have been appreciated had the rest of the episode not been so utterly fucking contemptible. Heart to heart between Not Shaggy and Gigi, yada yada yada, mid credit scene sees Fred accosted by Serial Killer and we're on to episode 8. In another apt metaphor for this show, we've jumped two days after Fogfest and found Daphne and Velma at the bottom of a deep dark ravine, profoundly regretting the circumstances that brought them to this point. Frustratingly, this is something of a flashback episode, so we're then told we're going to see Daphne's flashback and we've jumped two days back again. And in case that wasn't clear enough, Daphne's one dimension has reverted to its vehicle for meta joke state, and so she tells Velma, But wouldn't you agree that the strongest use of flashbacks on TV is when one character's flashback is intercut with another's to eventually combine in the present storyline? And it goes on. Saying if this was a flashback in your point of view, in order for it to be earned, we'd have to cut to, I don't know, Fred? And it goes on. I like it when they use a title card with the character's name when they cut to a different flashback. We're now with Fred, it's his flashback, he's been kidnapped, he's in a room with tanks containing the brains of the murdered girls, and they're talking to him. Then we're with Daphne again, and it goes on. I still say it's more seamless without the title card. And I still say my old job as a television executive makes me worry audiences won't be able to follow it. They're trying to unlock the serial killer's phone, which they got in the last episode, and I forgot to mention it because I don't care. They succeed. They plan to go to a mountain or something to find the serial killer. Meanwhile, with Fred, one of the brains has the gall to call this show a playful reimagining, which is just a flat-out lie, brain. Velma turns up at Daphne's before they leave for the mountain. Daphne rose Tico's it and says she can't come, because she and generic hot girl from a previous episode have to make a sexy calendar to fight discrimination against hot girls, because comedy again, I guess. The implication is there might be something more to this than we see, so Velma fakes an hallucination in a bid to break up another relationship. Not Shaggy and Gigi are also at the bottom of the deep dark hole, and because they're in this show, we get their flashbacks. They, it turns out, were planning to go to Gigi's cabin up by the same mountain. Meanwhile, Fred is flirting with a brain in a jar. There's absolutely no point covering the various exchanges and intervening flashbacks because they are what filler would consider to be unjustified filler, it's just more relationship bickering. We're more than halfway through the episode now, and so far what we've had is meta flashback commentary and, yeah, bickering. Mind you, at least when it's doing nothing, it's not being vile or especially painful. 
This might actually go down as one of the best of all the episodes, solely by virtue of the fact that absolutely nothing happens, and nothing even tries to happen. I did joke in my last video, by the way, about the exponentially expanding array of relationship combinations Velma and Daphne, Daphne and Fred, Fred and Velma, not Shaggy and Velma, not Shaggy and Gigi. At the current rate, by the end of this season, we'll have added not Shaggy and Fred, Velma and Gigi, Daphne and Gigi, Daphne and not Shaggy, Gigi and Fred, and the Chief of Police with a harem of underage schoolgirls. I didn't expect to actually have to add Daphne and Gigi to the list, but this episode adds it to the list. Apparently, they used to have a thing. Happily, though, they no longer have a thing. Daphne's thing is most definitely for Velma now. And again, inexplicable though it is, unjustified though it is, frequently forgotten by the writers as it is, if I had to pick one thing about this latest round of episodes to praise, it would have to be this again. The writers can do dialogue and meaningful exchanges when they want to. They can even construct a half-believable relationship with an actual dynamic and feeling element to it. Daphne explaining here that she's attached to Velma because Velma's jealousy amounts to a kind of obsessive protectiveness that she missed from her own lack of parents, paying off the realization in the last but one episode. That's genuinely not terrible as far as writing goes. It's a bit convoluted, though that's largely because they've had to cram it into about 10 seconds. But since we've had our allotted 10 seconds of non-abysmal content, it's back to the bickering. Via nonsense that I'm again not going to bother to explain, they end up falling further down the ravine and into the crystal caverns from however long ago. Not Shaggy and Gigi have exhausted their already exhausting role in the script and so they leave Daphne and Velma alone in the caves. Fred is still flirting with brains, it, it doesn't matter. Daphne and Velma decide they're too fucked up to be just friends, so it might be worth giving a proper relationship a go. Which, yeah, given the nonsense relationships I've been privileged to observe in real life, that might just be the show's only accurate meta joke. But they're interrupted then because they overhear Fred trying to explain to the brains, just, just go with me on this, why he cheated on them with each other. They let Fred out, but he causes a cave-in because stupid Fred. Velma falls down a crack, but her mum appears from nowhere and rescues her. That's what's called a reveal. It doesn't actually mean anything because we all hate this show and nobody's actually invested in its storyline, but it is functionally, technically a reveal. They escape in a van that looks suspiciously like the mystery machine, doubtless to be saved for and ruined in the second season of the show that HBO has greenlit in some underhanded way to prove the Mayans right. Inconveniently, Velma's mum can't remember who kidnapped her, meaning it's, yeah, it's probably her, isn't it? And with that devastating, heart-sinking feeling of inevitability, we crash into episode 9. On the plus side, we've nearly made it, just two episodes left. Episode 9 kicks off in hospital, where Velma's mum tells us she does indeed have amnesia. This is validated by Not Shaggy's therapist dad. You know, the one who had amazing magical powers for one scene because comedy, but is otherwise a target for the writer's contempt. Here is an allotted space for a witty one-liner from Velma, and because it's Velma, and we're all too familiar with it by now, I'm not even going to ask you what nonsensical put-down you think she'll deliver, because it's obviously going to be a white guy joke. Hey, no offense, but can we just let the actual doctor explain? Just being a white guy with a clipboard doesn't cut it anymore. Despite this, the actual doctor refuses to help because their insurance won't cover it. So it's left the therapist's dad to explain the premise of the episode anyway, which is that they have just 72 hours to recover her mum's memories before the memories are gone forever. The key to recovering them is that her mum must be kept happy, which is very inconvenient because, for one thing, she doesn't know that her husband has a new girlfriend and a new kid. So Velma and Co. decide to try and hide this fact by turning their house back into the mess that it had been when her mum still lived there, pushing new girlfriend out of the door. Velma's mother's memories do begin to come back, but this new mechanic unfortunately gives the writers an opportunity to waste an entire episode's worth of time by having Velma do all manner of quirky little side quests to keep her mum happy. Which would be bad enough, except that this waste of time isn't enough of a waste of time, and so the show also has a parallel set of side quests for Daphne, who has had her popularity stripped from her after she tried to leave the popular girl's brains behind in the crystal caves. Despite the show making a big thing several times about the difference between smart girls who have brains, and this being threatening to people generally and men in particular, and hot girls who have no brains and so enjoy unearned popularity, the show has, wait for it, forgotten all about it, even though it was the premise for, what, the first half of the season? So now, the hot girl's brains are the source of their popularity because that's what this torturous mess of a setup requires, because comedy. Both she and Fred have been exiled from the ranks of the popular kids for offending the brains they have to earn their way back in. 
Velma's current side quest means that she needs to send Not Shaggy on a side quest to break into his school principal mum's office to forge her some new report cards to show that she's been doing well in school. I don't give a fuck. We get more mindless cruelty at Fred's expense. We get another side quest, trying to find a reason for Waitress' girlfriend and her new kid that isn't that Velma's dad had an affair. So Velma pretends that the kid is hers and Not Shaggy is the father. This all triggers more memories in her mother about her breaking into the secret lab from however the fuck long ago, but which also, and less conveniently, triggers a long looking after baby sequence that is supposed to be funny and, of course, it's Velma, so it isn't. And that also triggers a long Daphne and Fred need their popularity back so pretend to date sequence, and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and I'm not going to subject myself, or indeed you, to any more of a summary than that other than to say that we are now 16 minutes into this 24-minute penultimate episode. We eventually find our way to the therapist's office where Velma finds a welder's mask like the one the killer wears, which gives us a cliffhanger but without the satisfaction of an ending because the episode isn't actually over yet. Velma seemingly disappears after this scene. But because this show's specialty is anti-writing, it turns out that this was an anti-cliffhanger. We were led to believe that Velma had been disappeared by whoever appeared in the office. In other words, Therapist Dad. He's the serial killer. But she hasn't, in fact. That was just a hilarious cut. And she just turns up at Not Shaggy's house the day after with a SWAT team and confronts Therapist Dad about the welder's mask she found. This is one of those comedic devices that doesn't really carry much comedy in on its own, but it can benefit from some comedic momentum. It's often the way with subversion. If the show in which the subversive device is deployed has already established its reputation as clever, funny, engaging, well-written, or whatever else, then the subversive device compounds the credit. It doesn't create the impression of any of the above, but it can maximize a pre-existing impression. It's something to use if you're already doing well. If, on the other hand, a show has already established itself as being terribly written, unfunny, not at all clever, trying too hard, and generally a mistake, the subversive device deployed for its own sake is simply irritating. This is what is known as the Ryan Johnson effect. So while I see what the show was attempting to do here, and might otherwise have been inclined to praise it, the fact this show is so hateable just makes this subversion of expectations seem as bad as frivolous and nonsensical and generally pointless as everything else. Shaggy's dad actually had a welder's mask because he was welding not Shaggy a sword for his birthday, so he's not the serial killer. Yay. What a spectacular waste of time. Daphne and Fred's popularity plan has worked, which, again because this is Velma, means the writers have somehow decided this is time to have a go at Chick-fil-A. Is that how you pronounce it, Americans? We don't have that in this country. Chick-fil-A? 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 Whatever. For some reason, the show decides to have a pop at it, with Fred's mum saying, Daphne, as much as it shocks me to say this, Fred is right. People expect you to go together, and it's not forever, just until you're popular enough to do whatever you want, like a homophobic chicken sandwich chain. A, it, like, an entire universe of, of potential jokes with which to cap off this, this little sub arc, and, and they decided to have a go at Chick-fil-A. That's a choice, because comedy, I guess. Fred's mum gives Daphne a job at their company. We don't have enough disparate plot threads on the go at the same time, so we learn that Fred's dad has overheard their plans, and he's now angry about that. Not Shaggy is annoyed at Velma for blaming his dad for the murders, so they're not friends anymore. More looking after baby stuff follows, more popularity stuff follows, Fred and Daphne kiss at the popular kids' party, Velma and the baby turn up, Velma gets upset, Velma's parents turn up, they learn the baby isn't hers, Velma's mum gets upset, she learns about the affair, which makes her miserable. The memory clock timer runs out. But she remembers everything anyway. She remembers that the serial killer is her. So again, that entire episode. Harrowing waste of time. Wasn't linked at all to the 72-hour device. The ticking clock ticked down to nothing. It wasn't even linked to her happiness or her unhappiness. But it would have been so easy to have her realize that it was tied to her true unhappy memories rather than to her happiness, to play it as though what she needed was to relive her bitterness, not some idyllic sham. At least then the reveal would have had some impact on everything we've learned about her since the mechanic this episode was supposed to operate by. Not to worry though, I'm sure the show will find some incredibly satisfying way to resolve all of this. There is, theoretically, a universe where this anti-writing genre works, 
but disobeying all laws of plot and narrative and native comedy is actually worth it. But if you're gonna make these sacrifices in the name of comedy, and your show turns out not to have any comedy in it, then suffice it to say, you fucked up. The plot of Velma, such as it is, is really an excuse for a whole host of disconnected and barely connected skits to take place. I'm sure this has been done in sitcoms before, but I'm tired and I can't be bothered to look that up. But none of these skits is funny. Nobody is invested in Velma for its comedy, because it doesn't have any. It sacrificed its A-plot for something that doesn't exist. But hey, we've made it to the last episode, so let's save that little roundup for the end and get through this as quickly as we possibly can. We begin with Velma's mom being carted off to prison. Velma delivers the most meta of all its meta lines, which is so meta that it doesn't actually realize it is a meta joke. And yet it got worse. And it continues being unknowingly meta. Because it made no sense. Who? Huh? Nothing added up, and yet no one seemed to care. Yet it still got worse. And yet it somehow got even worse. And to be honest, I could have just done that in lieu of this entire video, saving us all the time it's taking to go through the episodes. That pretty neatly sums up everything. So Velma's lost her friends, her mum's in prison, she's confessed to being a serial killer, and her self-professed motive is... I did it because I wanted to put the brain of a popular girl into the head of my daughter Velma. What? I just... yo, okay, okay, whatever. Velma still insists that none of this makes sense, even though actually, by the standards of this show, that actually makes an awful lot of sense. It's made all the popular kid jokes, it's made all the Velma's fugly and useless jokes, it's set up its own bitter and shallow internal morality, so this explanation would actually pay off all these things and be completely in keeping with the show's overall approach. If this actually turns out to be her motive, the one that Velma says makes no sense, no, that actually is the only thing in the show that would make sense, so I'm sure we're gonna have some kind of twist coming up. Anyway, Velma insists that it makes no sense, so she's off to investigate. Meanwhile, Daphne is starting her internship with Fred's mum, who is evil. Her company got rich off of child labor or something. Fred has bought Velma's mum's totally not the mystery machine van at an auction and begun turning it into the mystery machine. But this occasions, well, I mean, it's almost a Scooby-Doo reference, but it's also a pop culture reference, which means it has a hazy relationship with the thing it's referencing and is really just designed to belittle whatever target it has randomly chosen. The target in this case seemingly being the old Scooby-Doo cartoons themselves because these writers hate anything remotely good. The convoluted setup is, Fred is angry that his mum doesn't think he's capable of running the company. He's painted a flower logo for the company, like the flowers on the side of the mystery machine, because, and I quote, Wait, Fred, you bought this van? Why? Because all cool fashion advertising for teens is just trashy, pedo-tinged sex stuff. Actually, I think you'll find that's Balenciaga, actually, but carry on, Fred. Fred thinks that if he drives the Totally Not Mystery Machine around, he can make gentlemen's accessories cool. I, I, reasons, I guess. And prove he's not a joke. Leading Velma to observe... Because nothing's trashier or more pedo-tinged than teens in an old van. That's actually not a bad idea. Now look, I, I'm not especially precious about Scooby-Doo. I'm more just annoyed that the show has once again embarked on this long and windy road toward a punchline that doesn't land because its reference makes no goddamn fucking sense. But if you are precious about Scooby-Doo, I would fully understand if you were now yelling, keep my dog's name out of your fucking mouth. See, show? See? That's a pop culture reference that actually kind of referenced pop culture. It's not hard to do it, show. Oh, good, and it continues to scrape the bottom of the barrel at the bottom of the world's deepest hole full of barrels. Velma decides to get herself arrested, but the cops say nah because her mum's in the cell, so they're too busy. But, Natch, she's brought Fred along to accuse her of bothering him, and this means she does get arrested. Why? Why? What could the show possibly be playing off of here? Might it, perchance, begin with white and end with people? Why, yes, I think it might. Now then, remember how, a few episodes ago, Daphne's real mum escaped her lesbo cop mums in the Crystal Caves, but then got attacked by the serial killer, and so, presumably, was killed, but that it didn't really matter for the plot going forward because it served its only narrative purpose in giving Daphne clarity over her abandonment issues? Well, she's kind of back now, despite having been completely irrelevant to the plot since then because she's already served her only narrative purpose in giving Daphne clarity over her abandonment issues. 
Daphne finds a geode in her school locker containing a note from said absconding mother who apologizes for abandoning her and leaving her the pocket watch that she had found in the crystal cave. Meanwhile, Velma's mum reiterates to Velma that her motive was trying to put the brain of a popular girl in her head, but she says it repeatedly and in the same voice and with a weird expression, and so we learn that she never had amnesia, instead, no, she was hypnotized. Her mum gets carried away by the police to be executed before Velma can break the hypnosis. The serial killer is still out there, but the pocket watch thing Daphne has will help them find whoever it is. But then, Velma hallucinates again because it turns out the stopwatch was used to hypnotize her on the day of her mother's disappearance to induce hallucinations and prevent her from finding her mother, and the watch is inscribed with the name of the evil general who created Project Scooby, who was also a master hypnotist, so they need to go show the watch to the brains to see if the brains remember anything about the watch, but Fred's been arrested for luring people into the not mystery machine, so Daphne can't go, she has to go help Fred, while Velma meets the brains and the popular girls in the shower, so yay, we get another pervy shower scene again, so she explains her mom was innocent and shows them the watch, but none of the brains remember anything about it, but Gigi shouts at her for being mean to not Shaggy, who's now leaving the school because she's a shit friend, but she won't engage with it because she's too busy to do it. Holy Buddha on a unicorn, the writing in this fucking show, honestly, it had it spent like 90% less time on unfunny skits and not saved all of its plot progression for five minutes of its final episode, you genuinely might have been able to craft a serviceable and maybe even funny murder mystery reimagining of Scooby-Doo out of all the raw material this show has had to work with. It's genuinely not empty of content. It's just that the writers evidently didn't give a shit about the content and have only included it now out of some vague sense of obligation. Velma finally gets around to listening to all the voicemails from Not Shaggy that she's been ignoring, which triggers some sad memory music and a montage, as she finally realizes how good he was to her and how terrible she was to him. Which is actually, yeah, it's a nice touch. Excepting, of course, that we've already had this moment and it changed nothing. That's not a slight on this episode, that's a slight on the earlier episode, for wasting a legitimate device and denuding its proper use of whatever feelings it was banking on to have an effect. It's honestly as though none of the writers taking on these episodes watched the episodes that came before, or read the scripts around their episodes, or ever spoke to anyone else involved in writing for this show. But anyway, we don't get time to dwell on this almost realization on Velma's part, because the plot needs to move on again. And so, naturally, we get convenient information placement. Velma snaps away from the voice memos because she spots that her mother's glasses, which she's been wearing for the entire fucking show, were made by Fred's parents' company, the logo of which is the same as the logo on the pocket watch. So she picks up her dad, and off they go to Fred's house. And once again, once again, there is an entire scene of actual payoffs for actual character beats that doesn't suck because the show is actually letting itself be genuine for a change. It's clunky as hell and incredibly rushed and incredibly dense because it's all had to be crammed into this tiny fraction of the final episode, but we do actually get the conclusion of Velma's hallucinations arc, their link with her mother, with her father, with her need for affection from them, the reason for her enjoying not Shaggy's affection, the effect that had on her hallucinations now being explained, not because she found it hilarious, which was the cruel and mean-spirited explanation from earlier in the show, but because they were genuine feelings. And look, this is all really nice. Why couldn't we have had more of this throughout the show? She even calls Not Shaggy as she goes down a well into the secret lab and apologizes and tells her that he'll always be her best friend. Unfortunately, though the show has discovered some sort of relationship with genuine feelings, it still hasn't figured out a relationship with comedy. So having fallen down the well, we get this. Ugh, great. My phone's dead. Now I can't call back Norville or order Thai food. Velma finds her way into the lab where Fred and Daphne have been kidnapped and tries to free them before the serial killer comes back. He comes back, but then he gets interrupted by bats for reasons. So they tie him up. Velma gives us a recap of the killings, etc., which I'm not going through because talking about this show once has been painful enough and I refuse to revisit it. They unmask the serial killer, and it turns out it's Fred's mum. Yay! She's the daughter of the evil general guy. Her plan was to replace Fred's brain with a smarter brain. We get more backstory, and this is Velma, so the backstory is that the mad scientist's experiment succeeded, but because the mad scientist was a diverse woman and the evil general was a white man, he tried to take all the credit from her, causing her to undo her experiments with the brains and brick up the lab. So he had her institutionalized, but he could never recreate her experiments. Fred's mum 
married Fred's father to stay rich, they built the company, but she hated her son and was threatened by Velma's mum's investigations and so on and so on and so on. That explanation took a good few minutes, meaning we're now overdue a generic Velma joke, which Daphne duly delivers. Okay, but why pick the brain of a hot popular girl? We're literally the only murders people care about. Against which suggestion, I advance George Floyd and run away very quickly. Fred's mum wanted a hot popular girl's brain combined with a man's body to recreate her own ruthless ambition or something. But then she tells us that she's realized the perfect brain for Fred's body is Velma's. So her hypnotized husband walks in and twats Velma in the head and now everyone's been captured again. Velma raises a salient point. What's to stop her just going to the police once her brain is in Fred's head? But this is Velma, so the explanation is because why people? Who more than you would truly appreciate the advantages of being a handsome, rich, white man? And because patriarchy. Advantages? You think we like being president of the United States 97% of the time? That job sucks. Having spent time with the brains, I was reminded that hot, popular girls your age don't yet realize just how much the deck is stacked against them. And because rich guys. I am so sick of rich guys like you not only not realizing how much is handed to them, but still thinking they're the victims when they mess everything up because of their lazy entitlement and fragile egos. This pisses off Fred, and he breaks out of the shackles and frees everyone, but his mum escapes. Fred tracks her down, but she tricks him into thinking she's been possessed by a ghost because stupid Fred. Mother never could have wanted to swap my brain. She told me she's been possessed by the ghost of Dr. Edna Perdue. I do love it when shows give us a greatest hits compilation of all their most tired, worn out, tedious material. This is a real treat. Not Shaggy turns up to rescue them. A stalactite falls on Fred's mum. Velma twerks over the bloodied corpse. The town loves Velma, but her friends still hate her. Her mum likes her, her dad doesn't. Shaggy takes up weed to get over the fact that he killed someone. Fred owns the not quite mystery machine. And that is it for season one of Velma. We fucking made it. It was a close run thing because, my God, I mean, that was so appalling, it's practically its own genre, but we made it. I'm not going to go back over all the reasons for the show's awfulness. It's one note, not comedy. It's hypocritical feminism. It's baffling approach to narrative writing. The fact it delighted in its vindictive cruelty against any demographic its writers liked to pretend are privileged. It's approach to character writing that actually discourages investment in its characters. It's pop culture references that don't reference pop culture. It's smug self-satisfaction. It's detestable protagonist. It's nonsensical stakes. It's mere existence, etc, etc, ad nauseum. Now, there's no need to go back over all of that. Instead, let's try something more difficult. Let's try to fix Velma. 